continuing on to your topic three. So you want to know, once you already know the characteristic of heat, you also learn a bit on how heat is being transferred and the characteristic of heat being that you always want to make itself equilibrium. So if there's a higher temperature or there's a lower temperature, you want to ensure that all the surrounding temperature is the same. So with that in mind, and with, with this subject in mind, in this course, if you do, to put it in the perspective of thermal insulation in our house, we want to ensure that the room inside our house is at a comfortable temperature. So we do not want a room which have a, which have a temperature change of very rapidly, lah, or we have a temperature change which is not comfortable or desirable following what is available outside. So in Malaysia, usually we have a lot of, we, we only have summer. So we are, we are a tropical country and we are hot all year round. But if you were to go to other country overseas, particularly uh, UK or if it's close by China, then we have, they have uh, changes in temperature or season. So in China, we experience some sort of like a winter. So it's cold in China. But in Malaysia, we are hot all year round. Lah. So for in our industry, the construction industry regarding thermal insulation, there's not much thermal insulation done on the construction industry in Malaysia, except just the insulation to prevent heat from coming into the building. But when you go overseas, when there's different different season, then you need additional steps uh, to ensure that heat not only do not uh, you do not uh, you also not only gain heat from the environment, you also will lose heat to the environment due to the low temperature, which is during the winter. So in Malaysia, we only do for insulation for heat gain from the sun but we don't consider heat loss from the environment surrounding uh, due to the season so in malaysia our insulation is typically very standard so you only usually have the glass wool or fiberglass just to ensure that heat is not easily gained into our building so is so easily so uh the thermal energy, the transfer of the thermal energy through the fabric of the building is the main factor in the energy balance of the building. So in a building, as we occupy it, we want to ensure that we are comfortable in the building. So to ensure that we are comfortable in a building, we will need to ensure a very nice fine balance of temperature inside our building. So one of the way is we need to have sufficient thermal insulation so that heat gain from the sun do not easily raise the internal temperature of where we are at. Lah. So if the temperature of where we are at is increased suddenly or rapidly, then we will feel very uncomfortable to stay inside the building. Okay, so there's a lot of benefit towards a good thermal insulation if the building is well insulated so even in a hot weather then there won't be any changes to the temperature inside the structure lah. but if is a uh, if you have a very poor insulated structure then for sure lah, your building will gain a lot of solar heat and then when there's no solar heat and when the environment cool down during the night then because you don't have insulation in your building then your building also will be cooled down very rapidly. So this is not uh, very convenient lah. or you won't feel very comfortable inside a building. If the building is easily insulated or uh, is easily insulated up and down on the temperature. So there is also a problem because we are in an enclosed space. So when you're in an enclosed space, if your temperature were to rise and 
drop rapidly or quickly then because there's a lot of vapor in the air humidity then condensation might happen so when condensation happen it will actually damage the wall of the building as you can see here condensation inside a building so this is very unhealthy lah. so if you have a building and you do not ventilate it and as the humidity rises inside the building then you have all this sort of mold growing on your wall lah. so mold growing in your wall is actually very dangerous for your health so in the worst case scenario you can has you can have respiratory problem due to all this mold and then you might have allergic reaction lah to it so it's uh inside if you are in a building which is not regulated properly and you don't have a very good insulation and the temperature inside the room is very high then you have all this microbiolism growing inside your house or on your wall okay so if uh if your structure is very well ventilated then you will stay cool lah, even in a hot weather as compared to a poorly insulated structure so you don't have to spend a lot of money on appliances lah. instead of uh you don't have to spend a lot of money on running your appliances such as the aircon or heater if your building is able to keep itself cool or keep the temperature from being lost or gained up to the environment So you need to have your insulating material. So a good insulating material will not allow transfer of heat from your enclosed space into the environment. So this material tend to be porous and low density like the glass material. So air, which is a very bad medium of transfer of energy, is always used as a medium. Lah for even uh, even for the noise control and also even for the for the to oppose the transfer of heat so you'll find that to reduce sound or even to reduce the transfer of of the heat you always have an air pocket in between a wall so with this air pocket you'll be able to oppose the transfer of this heat from our inner house from being lost to the environment or from the environment being very hot to heat gain into our structure so is uh, also there's also other factors like what sort of surfaces our material have so uh, better surfaces can reflect away the heat wave so you know that heat travels transfer in three methods which is convection conduction and radiation so by having a very shiny surface you'll be able to reflect away the heat energy which can be gained from radiation okay so we have a few types of thermal insulator you can be a rigid preformed material is a concrete block or flexible material which is the fiberglass crit so this is very light so this is very dense we can have a loose few material a polystyrene granulized material formed on site or the form polyurethane reflective material which is the aluminium foil so all of these all of them have a function which is to insulate the building from being able to gain heat so an aerated concrete block although it looks big and heavy but actually the density of the material is less uh, because there's a hole in the concrete block so for the glass fiber and the aluminum foil you know that uh, is very light and thin and this is the type of thermal insulator that can be used to reduce the heat transfer in the structure 
so uh thermal conductivity is which is uh which have a sign of this lambda like this and a unit of watt over meter is a measure of the rate at which heat is conducted through a particular material under specific condition so this is a measure of how good a material is at conducting heat and then you have your resistivity which is the reciprocal of the thermal conductivity so it's just an inverse of your thermal conductivity so there are three factors which can affect the thermal conductivity of a material so is the first is the density the higher the density the higher the thermal conductivity so that's why a material which is less dense like your glass fiber and your aluminum foil is a very bad conductor of heat so because it's a very bad conductor of heat you want to use this material as a heat insulator so because it's very less it's very uh, it's very not dense less dense than a normal material so it's a very bad transfer of heat and also they are, have a lot of air pocket so air itself is also a bad conductor of or transfer medium of transfer of heat so this will in terms helps in providing the ex extra function of being a heat insulator so next is the changes in moisture content so moisture content will affect thermal conductivity in a way that as there's more moisture content in the particular air the higher the the higher the measure which is the heat able to transfer so insulation effect decrease lah, when there's an increase in presence of moisture content and finally you have your effect of time so material will always degrade as they degrade their performance also degrade so when their performance degrade heat will be able to travel better through the material as opposed to when it's newly made because all plastic material is man-made it's not natural so through the passage of time they will always degrade so typically you have a value of this lah. so this is the density of a normal concrete a lightweight concrete will have this density over the weight and then this is the thermal conductivity of the material so based on the density the more dense the material is the better the thermal conductivity for the material a lighter material with a less dense uh, compared to the volume ratio we have a lower thermal conductivity as shown here so this concrete normal weight and a concrete lightweight can have the same volume but different density so a normal concrete will weigh more than a lightweight concrete and because of that because of the difference in density their thermal conductivity the ability for the material to conduct heat is greatly reduced because of the uh, because of the properties which is the material is less dense as can be shown here so this is a picture of how heat can be transferred so from one end to another end this is a measure of how conductivity how conductive the material is so now that we learn about thermal conductivity we know that different different material offers different different level of resistance thermal resistance so with that a thermal resistance is a measure of the opposition to heat transfer offered by a particular component in a building element so there are generally different different type of material and there's three type of 
thermal resistant available. So the first is the material resistant, second is the surface resistant, and finally air space resistant. So air space is the pocket of air between material. So material can be your brickwork, can be your plaster, and surface is your outer surface and inner surface, lah, which is which can be your paint. Okay, so the you have your material resistance, which is represented by this formula. Uh, material resistance of uh, each material has different different thickness and different different thermal conductivity. So you cannot expect a brick and a plaster to have the same thermal conductivity because they have different density. So each material have their own resistance and based on the thickness of the material and the thermal conductivity of the material, each of them, each of the component of the material in a structure has their own material resistance, which is represented by this formula. <coughs> okay, so for your surface, surface resistance is a thermal resistance of an open surface, which depends on conduction, convection, and radiation of that surface. So the surface is usually a very is is not measured in terms of thickness. Ah. There's always a fixed value to it. <clears throat> and for airspace, it's an empty cavity. Though. So empty cavity usually is a air pocket or void, lah, which is filled with air. So how uh, for the total thermal resistance, it's just a multiplication or the sum of all these value. Lah the surface, the material, and the air cavity. So the more R value is, the better the material is at insulating uh, the heat. Okay, we have a table here. This is a standard table. Uh. So because your surface and your air space don't have a formula, so this is obtained based on experiment. So you can use this value for your assignment. So for your air space, either it's a ventilated or unventilated, depending on what sort of condition, depending on where the material is positioned, you will have different standard level of resistance. So it can be, so you have all these factors lah where either the inside surface is at the wall or roof, ceiling or roof, and how the heat flow, and also how good the surface emissivity is. Is it a good surface or a bad surface? So a good surface can be, be a regular glass, and a low surface can be an aluminum or galvanized steel, so it's not able to transfer the heat pro properly. So based on these two uh, different factors in which the component can be at is either it is at the wall, the construction element, or how the heat flow, and also the surface, you have different level of standard resistance. So you don't have to, uh, for your assignment, you just specify lah, like based on this surface, and then at, with this kind of material, you assume that the standard resistance for this inside surface wall is at let's say 0 0.123 lah. <clears throat> okay so next we have our thermal transmittance so heat is transferred through an element of a building by a number of mechanism so heat will always transfer lah, through different different medium but here the U value is a measure of the heat rate of heat flow in watts through a one meter square of a structure. So when there's a temperature or difference, heat will always flow from one area to another area. So this U value is a measure of the overall rate of heat transferred. 
under standard condition. So lower value is better lah in terms of thermal insulation. So it's just the inverse of the resistant thermal resistant. Okay, so example six on how to find out the U value of the cavity wall. So you're given a cavity, uh, you're given a structure with a cavity of 103 mm thick brick outer leaf, 50 mm of clear cavity. So this is your air pocket, lah. 40 mm of insulation box, 115 mm of your aerated concrete block, and an inner leaf with 11, 15 mm layer of lightweight plaster. So you're given a few material and the thermal conductivity is given as here and the thermal resistance is given below. So with that, if you uh, to make it simpler, you can draw it out. You have your inner surface, you have your plaster, you have your brickwork, you have your insulation board. <coughs> and with that, you have your air pocket and then you have your brickwork and your finally outer surface. So heat will flow from inside to outside. And then this is as per your specification lah, detail. So with that, with all the information, you know that your thermal resistance, which uh, because you need to find the U value, so you need to find your thermal resistance, is represented by R equals to D, which is the thickness, divided by lambda. So internal surface you're not given, so just not available, but you know that based on the table provided from here, you know your internal surface, which is 0 0.123 or 0 0.12. Lah. And you have your light plaster, which is provided the thickness, 0 0.015 which is this light plaster inside and outside. And then you have your aerated thickness, 0 0.115, insulation box, cavity, and exposed brickwork. So you're given this component and thickness. <coughs> you're also given the lambda for your component also. So to get the thermal resistance, you just multi, uh, you just divide them, lah, divide the thickness by the lambda and you'll get a value for your thermal resistance. <coughs> so you know that you have different, different thermal resistance for each component. So your total resistance for this particular set of wall is 3.22 meter square per watt. So to find the U value, you just use this resistance, total resistance that you obtain, you just inverse it lah, and you'll get 0 0.31. So this is your U value. Okay, so when you have different different component, so you need to uh when, when you say as a different component, means you have different surface area. So when you have different surface area, it will be a composite material. To get the average value, you will have to use this formula. Lah. This formula you should be familiar with. You can see it on topic 2. To get the average value of the U values. So uh, example 7, to calculate the U value when you have a composite material. So a certain uninsulated cavity has a U value of 0 0.91. So you add an insulation board to the construction. So what is the thickness required to reduce it to 0 0.45? So the thermal conductivity is 0 0.025. So you're given that the target of your U value is 0 0.45. And with the formula, you can inverse it and you get your first resistance, which is 0, uh, 2.22. The existing value of what you have for your this 
uninsulated cavity wall is 0 0.91 so you inverse it you get another set of total resistance so your targeted total resistance is 2.222 and your existing is 1.099 so the extra resistance you required from your this uh, insulation box is you take these two values you minus them together and you get 1.123 so you know that your material the lambda is 0 0.025 the thermal conductivity using the formula again you know that your total resistance is 1.123 extra required you just substitute this into the formula you put r equals to 1.123 and your lambda the thermal conductivity as 0 0.025 and you'll be able to find out that your thickness of your material is 28 mm so this the value what you obtain will be in meter lah. so as seen here all the formula is in your thickness is always in meter so you have to be careful on this lah for your this formula okay so that's about it for your thermal insulation so next up is condensation in a building so because your building is an enclosed space condensation in a building is a problem because whenever you go air will always be around so when you're in an enclosed space if it's not properly ventilated then the relative humidity in the room can go very very high and cause the room to be very very damp so in the worst case scenario you might find that your wallpaper if you have a wallpaper in your room being plastered onto the wall it will tear off because of how damp the room is or even if you have a floor tiling then you might find that mushroom might be growing off from your floor line. so a uh, principle of condensation is that when the humidity in the air the moist air reaches a certain level which is a dew point then it will start to condense so when this condensation happens and it starts to condense on your wall and your wall will become very wet so all this problem like mold growing on your wall will happen so generally a uh, requirement for how condensation will happen in a building is you have moist air and you have a very cold surface area so usually you'll find that your wall or your wall will get very very cold so the moist air will start to condense onto your wall so condensation doesn't just happen and you have a cloud inside your room lah. but what will happen is the difference in temperature between your environment in your room and your wall when it reaches a certain level of humidity and the temperature on your wall there's a this my minor difference where your wall is cooler than your air condensation will start to happen on your surface of the wall so there's factors in which can uh, there's different different factors which influence the rate condensation so there is four one of them is a moisture source so moisture present in any sample of air comes from a source of water <coughs> so inside building source is normally from occupant and their activity lah. so as moisture content increase the chances of condensation happening inside your enclosed space increases so next is the temperature so warm air can hold more moisture than cold air cool air so next one is ventilation 
So ventilation, ventilating a building lowers the moisture content inside and reduces the risk of condensation. And finally, you have the use of building. So includes change in design of building, method of heating building, and moisture making activity. So many dwellings are now occupied only in the evening and at night. So a lot of factors can influence how condensation can happen in a building. So if there's a difference in temperature in the air and your wall, it will cause condensation to happen. And if your moisture content of your room is very high, condensation will also happen. Ventilation will reduce the risk because you will be able to remove the moisture content in your room. So usually to maintain the temperature, you want to ensure that your room is closed off so that you do not gain or lose any temperature. <clears throat> so next is the usage of the building. So if you are making a lot of if you're having a lot of activity involving water, then definitely there will be a very high increase of your moisture content inside your room. <clears throat> so there is different different methods to remedy condensation to ensure that it doesn't happen. So if you were to ventilate your enclosed area, then before they have a chance to reach that critical level where condensation happens, you'll be able to remove the high percentage of the humidity in your room out to the environment. Next is by heating. So because as you increase the temperature in the room by increasing the air temperature, this means that the air will be able to hold more moisture and you'll be able to keep them above the dew point of the air inside the room. <clears throat> and then lastly, you can have insulation. So you will be able to reduce the rate at which heat is lost through a structure. So when the inside, when the surface is warm, and if there's no difference in temperature between the surface of your wall with the air inside the room, then condensation will not happen. <clears throat> So condensation happens in a structure when there's a difference between the air temperature and the surface temperature of the wall. So when it reaches that dew point, then condensation will happen onto the wall of your structure. <clears throat> so there's different different way to measure humidity. You have your hair hygrometer and you have your this wet and dry bulb hygrometer and either that or you use a new method, so electronic hygrometer. <clears throat> so humidity is always in our environment. So we cannot run for it. In Malaysia, we have a very high humidity content because we are in a tropical country. So our environment is basically hotter as compared to other country. So because our environment, our weather is hotter than other country, that's why our humidity level is higher. So in Malaysia, you will find that it is very stuffy if you are inside the jungle and during the afternoon. But if you were to go to other country, because they are cold, you'll find that the moisture content is very low. So what will happen if you encounter this sort of situation is that you find that your skin is very dry. Whereas in Malaysia, because the humidity is high, you won't feel as dry lah from the weather. So uh, humidity is also a form of latent heat. So more humidity, more latent heat. So another thing about humidity is that if you have very high humidity in an area, you will not find that your sweat will be very able to evaporate easily. <clears throat> okay, so next is your water vapor. 
So humidity can be obtained from water vapor. So the vapor can be defined as a substance in a gaseous state which may be liquefied by compression. And then you have your saturated vapor pressure. So this is the vapor pressure of the water vapor in an air sample that contain the maximum amount of vapor possible at that temperature. So higher temperature, higher saturation of water vapor. So in a sense, you can have a warmer air will be able to hold more moisture as compared to colder air. So you compare country, country to country. In Malaysia, we are a tropical country. So in our environment, our air here is very humid as compared to cold country where they are air where they are, the air there is dry. Okay, so moisture content is a measure of the absolute humidity. So the actual amount of quantity of water vapor inside the air. So it's represented by this formula. So mass of the water vapor in an air sample and mass of the air sample when dry. So it's just a percentage how much moisture can be available in the air. So it's just a percentage. Of, so it's in units of kg over kg of dry air. It's just a ratio of air when it's completely dry and the air on the, the water vapor inside the air. Okay, so next we have our dew point. So a dew point is the temperature at which a fixed sample of air becomes saturated. So when saturation happens, then water will form from the air vapor. So if moist air is cooled, then a certain temperature, the air becomes saturated with water vapor. So when it comes into contact, you will form liquid. Lah. So this is what you can see in the morning. So if you went to a playground or you went to a basket, a football field, you'll find that during the morning, because of the difference in temperature where the plant is cold, then you'll find that condensation will happen onto the leaf of the grass. So this is a representation of how condensation will happen due to a dew point. Lah. So it becomes so saturated that because of the difference in temperature, <coughs> the water vapor or the humidity in the air will start to condense from vapor into liquid. Okay, so relative humidity is a measure of the amount of warm air which can hold a certain temperature relative to the amount of water in that air. So if it's at 100% humidity, it's 100% saturated, lah, the air is. So it's fully saturated, 100% uh, relative humidity is a fully saturate, saturated air. So it's a mist or fog. So at 0%, it's a perfectly dry air. So this we will not be able to find it lah, unless we were to make it or stimulate this sort of environment. So heating the air will lower the relative humidity and cooling the air will increase the relative humidity. So this is uh, related back to how, what is the characteristic of the air lah. As you heat up the air, you'll be able to hold more moisture and as you lower the air, you'll be able to re reduce the pressure. Okay, so to another example, which is this, uh, air sample, which has a relative humidity of 40% at a temperature of 20 degrees, so are you so you have to calculate the vapor pressure of the air. So using the formula here, Rh equals to vapor pressure of the sample. 
you are which you are not given you are given 40 percent of relative humidity divided by the svp of the water vapor at 2340 so you just move them around you'll find that the vapor pressure is at 936 pascal so this is just a simple example of showing how the formula can be used given all the factors okay so this is the last part of the topic for topic three so this psychometric chart is a set of chart which are combined so that they can plot the relationship between the different variable used to specify humidity so this psychometric chart is used to specify the humidity so there's different different terms here dry bulb temperature wet bulb temperature dew point your relative humidity specific humidity and entropy so these few factors they are all plot out and put into a single graph which you can see here so this is not clear let me open the chart So uh, this is a representation of how the chart will look like, but this is not detailed. Lah. So basically, this is how you measure, uh, how you use the chart. So dew point, you have to draw a straight line. Wet bulb is from this line. You have to draw a line from here. Drive you have your dry bulb scale down here, specific humidity, and your water vapor pressure. So this is a point in a chart. How to get the point, you have to match two factors that you are given with. Okay, so let me go in depth with this. So this is a chart that you will find. This is a psychometric chart lah. so down there you'll be able to find your dry bulb dry bulb temperature so starting from negative 20 to zero so zero degrees celsius all the way to 60 degrees celsius <coughs> so you have your line here lah. 15 16 17 18 19 20 so you have a line all the way up and then you have your wet bulb temperature which is represented by this line <coughs> which is represented by this line so you start from negative 15 up to a maximum of 30 so let's say your wet bulb temperature is at 19 so here 15 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So you have your 20 here, your 19 is here. So just a line below here, this is your dry bulb, dry, uh, wet bulb temperature. So it's a line coming down this way. And then next is your humidity. So humidity is represented by this percentage, 90%. So at 100% humidity, you'll be on this uh, wet bulb temperature. And then as it comes down, you will have your relative humidity. As you can see here, 10%, 15, 20, 25, 30, you'll be by a curve line across this chart. And then you have your vapor pressure here then you have your humidity ratio which is represented by your scale of here 0 5 10 vapor pressure here from 0 10 12 ok 
Okay, so because you know this is your uh because based on this relative humidity, which is represented by percentage, so 10, 15, 50, all the way up to 90 here, you know that at this point here is 100 percent humidity so your dew point is actually at this point so at 10 degrees celsius humidity is at 100 this will be your dew point but for your dew point you need to draw a straight line lah. so which will be shown in i will go through more in detail more in detail when i go through the example lah. so drive out you have your scale of measure here you just draw a line from 25 up and for your wet bulb you will be on this scale on this curve and the line will be like that down you will be a uh, cross here down so this is another set of scale and here is also another set of scale which is this this is the same set of scale and that's about it lah, on how the how this uh, how this chart can be read off okay so let's have a look at the example so you're given uh, two mixture of air given that is being mixed at a ratio of one to three so your fresh air has a 30 degrees celsius of dry bulb and 25 degrees celsius of wet bulb and you have your recirculated air at 22 degrees celsius for dry bulb and 17 degrees celsius for wet bulb so you mix them together and you get a mixed air so this question is asking you what is the mixed air dry bulb temperature wet bulb temperature and the relative humidity so based on these two value uh, these two factors given dry bulb and wet bulb you'll be able to find what is the mixed air by combining both of them together you are also given the ratio of one is to three so for that you know that your recirculated air is 22 degrees celsius dry bulb so the dry bulb the scale is here and your wet bulb the scale is here so from here the dry bulb you just draw a straight line which is 22 degrees and then from here you know that your wet bulb is 17 degrees celsius so you draw a line down here so this will be your first point a for your point b you will do the same also using a 30 degrees celsius dry bulb and 25 degree so 30 degrees draw a straight line up and 25 degrees based on this scale and you draw a line down so you got two point a and b so because the air is mixed in a ratio of one is to three so you draw a line you just ratio it out one to three you get your mixed air temperature so you draw a line down the mixed new mixed air temperature is 24 degrees celsius and the wet bulb is 19 degrees celsius and then based on this new point you'll be able to read off this chart what is the relative humidity so based on uh, this i don't think it's clear so based on this if you were to work it out you get close to 63 percent relative humidity so this chart is not clear lah. so you want to draw on this chart so the reading based on this chart is like this but if you want to make it to be more accurate you can use calculation method lah. but the calculation method can only get you the exact value for your wet bulb and dry bulb so you without using the chart you will not be able to find what is the relative humidity so no matter what you still have to use this chart lah. but by using this formula this is a standard composite 
to get the average value of your temperature formula, you'll be able to find the exact temperature. Lah. So uh, you don't have to use this method. This is alternative method to find the value. If you're given other factors, you won't be able to use this formula to find out the, the value lah for your temperature. Okay, so for your second example, so you're given external air at zero degrees Celsius. So this is your dry bulb and relative humidity at 80%. So you're hitting this, this two, uh, this two point, these two factors given to 18 degrees. So you have to find what happens when you hit the air from zero degrees Celsius to 18 degrees. What is the new relative humidity of this of this air? And then after that, you need to add 0 0.005 moisture, kg of moisture. And what happens and at what temperature the moisture air would first condense? So for the first part, for the okay, for the dry bulb. You know that you're given zero degrees Celsius here, which is the dry bulb. So you just draw a line and you're given 80 degree, uh, 80 percent of your relative humidity. So you draw a line here, follow, you get your first point. So then after that, you draw just a straight line through all the way and you get that your moisture content of your this air is actually 0 0.003. So what will happen if you hit this air from zero degrees to 18 degrees. So you just find out the scale based on the scale here. What is the dry bulb temperature? So you just draw a line up. So the new, the new relative humidity of this heated air is actually 23% RH relative humidity. So we just uh, give an approximate value lah, based on these two scale on this chart. So this is for part A. Lah. For part B, is asking you what will happen to the RH if you add 0 0.05. So to add 0 0.05, you just from this scale, you just add 5 lah, for 1, 2, 3, and then you add here 5. You'll be 0 0.008. So you just draw a line all away, all across here, and you draw a line from 18 all the way up. So here you'll be able to find that is 62, uh, 62 percent of the RH. So it's very close to 60, and it's just above it. So it's 62 percent relative humidity. And finally, you have your temperature at which this moist air will first condense. <clears throat> so it's still on this uh, heated, it's still on this heated, uh, it's still on this heated air, but it's asking at what temperature will this moist air first condense. So when it says condense, what is the dew point temperature of this air? So you know that your relative humidity is based on this scale in which you're using. So at 100% is at this wet bulb scale. So to get the temperature at which the air will start to condense, which is the dew point, you just continue on, draw a straight line from right to left. From your 0 0.008, you draw it all the way to your this wet bulb scale, and you'll get that your temperature is 10.8 degrees Celsius. So this is your temperature at which it starts to condense. Is your dew point lah? Okay, so this is how you. This is an example of how you use this chart lah to find out the temperature, the relative temperature, uh, relative humidity,
the air moisture content and the dew point and the dry bulb here, wet bulb, and this is how you make use of the chart. Mm. Okay, so the chart here is not clear for a clearer view of the chart, which is this PDF. I've already uploaded into your Google Classroom. Okay, so that's about it for the lecture.